Okay, greetings class. This is Double Jar Pool with Unit 1, Music, Neurology, and Evolution. And we're going to do a preview of the music instinct. So, let's get started. First, I want you to view the selected sections I've inserted into my narrative here in Lesson 2. Then I want you to go and view the entire video on my World Music blog. And that's at hu 120 dot blogspot.com. Now all you have to do is go over to the uh, PowerPoint that I've uploaded and I have the uh, link right there anyways. So uh, it'll be a featured video. So when you go to the blog spot, it's going to come up uh, right away and then you can just expand the screen and watch it. Now you'll get more out of the documentary after going through my preview, but I can assure you, you're going to enjoy the entire work anyways. It's really that good. As you watch the video, I want you to keep in mind five recurrent themes. For the first is music performance engages the maximum parts of the brain, the symphonic brain, in peak capacity function. So you have music, perform excuse me, music performance, maximum engagement, and peak capacity. Those three items form a little nexus there that are very intimately related, and it'll make perfect sense as you move along. The second one is music, music performance stimulates brain plasticity and neurogenesis. So there you have music performance, brain plasticity, and neurogenesis. The third item is there's a deep relationship between music making, learning, and healing. So again, we have a nexus of three, music making, learning, healing. Now the fourth one is there are differences of opinions around the relationship between music making language, and evolution. So that's something you want to keep in mind too. Music making, language, and evolution. Then the fifth has two items. The study of music of the brain accelerates knowledge of the brain. That is, the study of music and the brain accelerates knowledge of the brain. And this will be a recurrent theme as well. So let's go over them real quick. The first nexus is music performance, maximum brain engagement, Peak capacity. Then we have number two, music performance, brain plasticity, and neurogenesis. Then we have three, music making, learning, and healing. Four, there's a, dif there's a difference of opinions between the relationship of music making, language, and evolution. And then the fifth, the study of music in the brain accelerates knowledge of the brain. Now, you're not going to see much about uh, that quote that I've used a lot, which is neurons that fire together, wire together. And that's because that concept really wasn't, uh, really wasn't well known when the video was made. The video was made in 2009, and this is more recent than that. So with that, let's get started. So now you see that at the start of the documentary, uh, the guy's voice you're hearing is Bobby McFerrin. He's an excellent musician, and I think it's a very noble soul. You'll you'll notice that all through his uh, all through the documentary. So Bobby McFerrin gives us an excellent example of the real power of music: its direct experience versus potential symbol carrier. And remember, we talked about that in my last lesson, where I used those two examples. Uh, the one being the uh, somebody who was at Normandy during the war versus your first time hearing a music like a rock band or a rap band or whatever it is, it really hits you. Um, and so one of the things that he says that notes that to this day, Bobby can't explain, even to himself, he says it's beyond words, it's beyond language, and he can't explain why he felt the way he did. That's important as we now move along. 
His musical experience was beyond language. Now, in this next segment, I call it the inner piano, and then the electrical firing symphonic brain. All right, let's start off with, in the ear, the cochlea is the auditory segment, and it's described in the video. And then the auditory cortex, which is in the brain, is a neuron, uh, obviously, uh, complex. But what's interesting is that they're both laid out like a piano, from low to high. Okay. The overtone series are contained in the lower fundamental of the tone. Now, let me explain this just briefly. When you hear a tone, your ear conflates it to one. So you hear do or whatever. Okay? And, but that tone is actually composed of higher tones that issue upward. They're higher, and they're in a very definite repeated pattern for every tone. It's the same pattern, but starting in a different uh, different place. So what happens is that your ear conflates, your ear and your brain conflates the overtones, so you don't really hear them. You just hear the basic fundamental tone. Now, there's ways to hear the overtone. You actually can hear them, but that's kind of a digression from uh, for us right now. At any rate, what this is saying is that the cochlea and the auditory cortex are an analog to the overtone series, which is why it's from low to high, because the higher overtones are actually contained in the lower tones. So this also explains the universal music concur occurrences that can be found among all humans. It's called the centrality of the octave and the physics of sound that creates the relationship between what we call consonance and dissonance. Now, we're going to talk about that a little bit further on. But basically, there is a physics in sound that is then, as an analog, repeated in the physics of the brain. On one hand, they're saying there are no universals in music, that each culture uh, produces music according to their own aesthetics and tastes, and that there's really, and their own environment, and there's really no commonalities. This really argues against that because there's a certain physics to the tone itself. And then there's a physics, an analog to that physics in the brain. So then the segment moves on to uh, the fact that there are no music centers, right? Uh, Daniel Levitin calls it the neurosympathy, excuse me, the neurosymphony, and uh, we call it the symphonic brain. The activity is all over the brain. There's no center. Now keep that in mind, because in terms of evolution, that's very important. So the brain must synthesize all of this activity into one coherent process from all over the brain. It does it in about one thirty thousandth, uh, one yeah, one thirty thousandth of a second. Now add to that the concept that we've now introduced since the video was made: neurons that fire together, wire together, and that reoccurring theme is going to keep following us all through the course. Somewhere in there, this gray thing inside of our head plays a role. The brain. For most of us, the vibrations of sound waves are relayed to the brain through the ear, which converts them to neural signals. As the sound hits the eardrum and it wiggles in and out, it sets up pressure waves inside a snail-like structure called the cochlea. The cochlea has hair cells lining it that are tuned to specific frequencies. So at one end, the hair cells only fire an electrical charge in response to low frequencies. At the other end, they fire an electrical charge in response to high frequencies, and of course, everything in between. So the signal goes from the ear to the brain stem and up into the brain. And that electrical charge goes to the auditory cortex, which is amazingly laid out in pitch order, almost like a piano keyboard. The hair cells are wired to the auditory cortex in such a way that you've got low notes stimulating this part of the auditory cortex on up to high notes stimulating this part. We used to think that there was a music center in the brain. We don't think that anymore. There are music centers and they're spread all over the brain. The auditory cortex activates as it receives signals from the brainstem through the inferior colliculus and the medial geniculate nucleus. 
If you could look at all the different areas of the brain involved in extracting the signal from sound and turn it into music, you'd see a bunch of coordinated and a bunch of uncoordinated firing in different parts of the brain, kind of like a neural symphony, a neural orchestra. So pitch is processed in one set of neural regions, tempo in another, loudness in another, timbre, whether it's a violin or a trumpet or a human voice in yet another, and it all comes together later. The later in this case is maybe 30 thousandths of a second, so rapidly that you never knew the things were ever apart. Okay, so this segment uh, gives you a graphic illustration of how the PETG and fMRIs actually track what's going on in the brain. They do it by tracking, they're tracking the firings by actually tracking the energy required to make the firings, which is, of course, oxygen, blood, right? Blood is carrying the oxygen to the brain. It's the whole purpose of the, our, our uh, blood system is to take oxygen to the rest of the body, the cardiovascular system. At any rate, so uh, again, there's a big emphasis on music performance, right? They're not just sitting there getting their brain scanned while they're listening to music, they're getting it scanned while they perform. Now I have to say, so no explanations for why these particular musicians were chosen for the experiment. Whatever your taste is, I guess. Uh, maybe they're the only ones available, I don't know. Anyways, here goes. Not just the brain research, but the technology of it has improved in the last 10 years. We can now take pictures of the brain in action. That's what fMRI and PET technology does. We can track where the blood or the oxygen is flowing in the brain, and this is allowing us to map the different functions and regions of the brain in ways that just weren't possible 10 or 15 years ago. Brain scans using PET and fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, are now used to see what happens when we listen to music and when we perform it. All right, now in this short segment here, we see the same uh, neurologist, Lawrence Parsons, quote, when we look at music performance, there is no activity that we do that allows the brain to do so many things at once. Quote, the brain at its peak demand, unquote. Now consider that, along with the phrase now well understood among neuroscientists, neurons that fire together, wire together. So analyze what he said. When we look at music performance, there's no activity that we do that allows the brain to do so many things at once. And that's because so many parts of the brain are being engaged. Again, when you consider that with neurons that fire together, wire together, you can understand the significance. Now, he also says, music helps us understand how the brain organizes information, right? It's from the entire brain is organizing this information, synthesizing it in that one 30 thousands of a second that we talked about to make a coherent whole before we even know that the parts were actually separated. So here we go. If you look at music performance, there's no activity that we do that allows the brain to do so many things at once at such a complicated coordination and with such depth. It tells us a lot about the brain at its peak demand, uh, situations would demand the most from it. The brain is teaching us about music and music is teaching us about the brain. Music is allowing us to understand better how the brain organizes information in the world. Okay, now in this segment, Steve Mithin examines a thousands of years old flute that was found in a cave. Now the cave is the natural prototype for what we will encounter in the Kiva of the Southwest Native American civilization known as the Anasazi. You'll see that in lesson three. But notice how the cave serves as a large instrument itself to interact with the symphonic brain through echoes and resonance. And also notice how the cave was not just used for protection, but for music, art, and ritual. Take it away. So this is the earliest flute in the world. I don't yeah. we know of. Yeah. We know. 
I think music was as much a part of yeah. daily life then as it was today. Yes, it was in a slightly different form. And also the caves are ideal settings for music. You have beautiful echoes, beautiful acoustics. Ah, because here. of natural acoustics. Yeah. And inside, it must be like a sort of a whole multimedia experience because you'd have all the flickering fires on the wall, smoke and smell and all that stuff going on as well, wouldn't you? It'd be fantastic. All right, so in this next segment, you'll hear this term universals discussed. Uh, what they're talking about is, as we discussed earlier, whether or not humans have an innate musicality as common to all humans or whether it's completely culture specific. OK, well, I've already argued that it's it's uh, there, there are commonalities and it's rooted in the biology. So let's just touch upon the uh, the overtone series again. So all tones can consist of a series of tones that the ear and the brain conflates into one basic tone. That basic tone, the lowest tone, is called the fundamental and is what we equally hear and give a name to. What, I mean, excuse me, what we actually hear and give a name to. Do, re, as I said earlier. So you have a fundamental and it has a series of overtones that come in a pattern. And some of these tones repeat more than others. If you pick another tone, and the interval is a distance between these two tones, so we call the interval. So this tone, if it's already in the overtones, especially within the ones that repeat the most, then its overtones match up, or at least very closely match up, with the first tone. In the case of what we call an octave, they almost exactly match up, which is why uh, sometimes when somebody plays an octave, you're not sure if there's only one tone or two. Case of a fifth, which is the most repeatable uh, tone in the um, overtone series, also, you can hear clearly that it's two tones, but it's what the uh, the narrator lady calls um, smooth, right? Because it's already in there. Its tones match up pretty well, so its vibrations and the vibrations of the lower tone they match up, and so you can hear that there's two tones, but there's very little clash. They're very, what they, it's what they call smooth really what we call is consonant. Dissonance is when they're clashing. The first tone and the second tone have very little in common. What's repeating in its overtones is not repeating or very little repeating in this one's overtones. So when they're played together, you get this very harsh clashing sound, and that's called dissonance. So this overtone series, what we call the overtone series, also explains why the cochlea and the auditory cortex are laid out low to high. And so there we have that argument about universals. All of our uh, auditory apparatus is set up the same, and it's set up the same because of the physics of sound. So therefore, there are obviously going to be universals uh, within the music of cross-culturally, and there are in the music's cross-culturally. Uh, the octave, which we'll explain at another time, is the common reference uh, element in all music everywhere. But we're also going to find in rhythm, there's also similarities, also cross-cultural similarities rooted in the nervous system. So let's go to this segment. What interested me about the finding of the flute, if you've gone to the web and you've heard the scale that it plays, mm -hmm. the scale isn't that different. So there's something about the acoustics of overtones. There's something there that prefers consonants. Consonants, smooth sounding intervals. So these clues from the past make us ask, are there certain things about music that are universal across time and culture? OK, now keep in mind that the actual footage from the videos is very little, right? I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a preview and I'm actually letting you mark where to start and really listen. But the part that I'm referring to is much longer than what I'm actually including in this presentation. Obviously, I want you to see the whole video, but I want you to pay attention to special segments. All right, so let's move on to segment seven, Rhythm from Cerebellum to Frontal Lobe. Uh, this is Daniel Levitin speaking, and he says, In the case of the brain locking into or in training to rhythmic pattern or beat, it is the cerebellum, this part in the back, the oldest part of the brain, that locks in. 
The frontal lobe, it's part of here, the newest and uniquely human part of the brain, analyzes what the cerebellum is locking into and allows the brain to improvise other patterns around the rhythm and the beat. It's anticipating, but it's also analyzing. So when you see syncopation going on, for instance, playing on the upbeat for you, those of you who are musicians, or you hear a da da da, and then you go da 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 Right? That's that's not what I'm doing. The cerebellum locks into the beat, but all this playing around with it, the off beats, the syncopation, that's done as a combination of the frontal lobe, frontal lobe all the way back to the cerebellum. Again, it's the entire brain from the front all the way to the back. It engages the entire brain from the oldest part of the brain to the newest and many, if not all the parts in between. There's this particular part of the brain up here in the frontal lobe that is unique to humans. Hmm. We're the only species that has it, but it's connected to the most primitive part of our brain, the cerebellum that all vertebrates have going back to fish and frogs. Oh, yeah. So when you get into that kind of a rhythm and it locks, right. it's the cerebellum that's locking to it. And it's the frontal lobe that's trying to predict what's going to happen next, whether you're aware of it or not. Now, this section is also uh, very short, but it's really important. The narrator says that humans have gotten very good at choosing the kind of music that will make them feel certain ways. This will become very important later on when we talk about music ritual and what I call self-modification. You notice that the human can modify his own state of mind anywhere, any place. All he needs is his body. He just needs to clap, sing, or just sing to himself. He can even imagine the music. But he can change his own state of mind without any reference to external stimulus. This is one of the critical areas, I think, in human evolution, the ability to self-modify at will and not wait for the environment to modify you or you to adapt to it. So here it is. And we choose certain pieces of music with certain characteristics to make us feel a certain way. People have become very good at knowing what pieces of music they need to hear in order to change their mood in a particular way. All right, now this section is particularly interesting. A lightning strike hits a fellow, right? It's very funny when he thinks he's dead, right? So first of all, let's notice the relationship between a near-death experience by electricity, lightning, a lightning strike, and the rewiring of the brain, as they refer to the outcome. The rewiring, music, and learning. So we have a lightning strike, rewiring, and then music and learning are the outcome. It's very odd. Maybe it's a coincidence, I don't know. The music and learning aspect suggests that brain plasticity occurred not just as he embarked upon his new musical obsession, but also in the act itself the actual lightning strike. Neurons fire as electrical charges. If Sachs suggests that the brain was rewired, that is, the neural networks were reconfigured, then there must have been new connections made, a massive amount of neural firings, and a mass stimulation of neurogenesis via brain plasticity. A mass sudden firing of neurons. Remember, neurons that fire together wire together. It kind of brings to mind the, the Frankenstein story, doesn't it? I mean, what is it that brought Frankenstein to life? And in the movie, anyways, where the crazy guy put the uh, all the electrodes, right? It was on his brain, mostly. I don't know. Maybe I'm going a little bit too far there, but that's really interesting, isn't it? And to think that uh, that long ago, a young lady, only 18 years old, Mary Shelley, wrote Frankenstein. At any rate, he then proceeded to become very highly proficient pianist. That's the, the fellow that was hit by the uh, lightning. He had to learn a new instrument and a new musical genre. That was not the genre he used to listen to. And he did this in middle age. It's fascinating, isn't it? Lightning strike. 
all the neurons, brain plasticity, neurons that fire together, wire together, massive explosion of uh, neuron firings. And this guy all of a sudden is learning a completely new genre of music. And he wasn't a musician to begin with. And he's also got quite good at it. It's just something to think about, doesn't it? Neurologist Oliver Sacks has remarkable stories of changes in adult brains in connection with musical ability. One such story was presented to me by a colleague, Tony Sequoia. Tony described uh, an extraordinary transformation in himself 15 years ago. Uh, he was a, uh, a busy surgeon, he's still a busy surgeon, um, uh, with very little taste for music. I was on a phone in a lightning storm. I uh, was struck. And I had an, a profound out-of-body experience, near-death experience. And I remember thinking, oh, shit, I'm dead. But he wasn't. He walked away and seemed completely normal. But then about three weeks later, he developed what he called a sudden passion, a sudden insatiable desire to hear piano music. Tony, who himself actually has a, uh, a PhD in neuroscience, as well as being a surgeon, he said, as, as a medical man, he said, I can't explain it. Sicoria, who'd only been interested in rock and roll, began to listen to classical music. I have no explanation for it. In talking with Dr. Sachs, he thinks that the part of my brain's been rewired. And certainly, I think that to some extent that's true. One often thinks, you know, one's plasticity, one's ability to learn, one's ability to do anything new ends with childhood. It clearly doesn't. Oh, and by the way, Oliver Sacks is a very famous uh, neurologist. A movie was made based on one of his books, and it was called Awakenings. And it involved music as a therapeutic tool to get through to people in catatonic trance. So I highly recommend that movie if you're interested in the subject of music and healing. Now, in this segment, we see Stephen Mython's experiment, the one that I was telling you about earlier. He takes one year of singing lessons, and again, it's music making. And it shows increased activity in a part of the brain that previous, previously showed very little. Blood flow as an indicator of neural firings. We've looked at that before. That's, again, Lawrence Pearson. Uh, excuse me, Lawrence Parsons, the neuroscientist. The experiment shows more neurons, not just more neuron firings. So it's actual brain matters increased. And uh, Stephen Mython's own uh, quote there is, I was astonished that within just a year, I could have manipulated my brain in that way. Remember, remember what we said earlier, self-modification. It's not that you're changing your mood. You're actually changing your brain. You're increasing brain matter. The brain changes, even in adulthood. That is, that is truly awful. Yeah, it is awful. <laughs> Stephen Mython decided he wanted to see if music could change his brain, the brain of a non-musician. He asked neuroscientist Lawrence Parsons to scan his brain before and after singing lessons. Now, here's, here's what you did a year later. We've got um, a, a set of areas that after your year of singing mm -hmm. to compare before your year of singing were increased in activity. Yeah. And when you say increased, you mean that's where there's more blood flowing in my brain right think it's just more activity going right that so manages that, does it? exactly so we're, okay. we're using blood as an indicator of okay. neural firing we found um, the strongest area was this area 
on the temporal pole in the superior quantum plurality is an area that we've, in many other, several other studies, yeah. shown to be active for representing musical structure. So when I started, there wasn't much activity in that area? No. Because of just hearing sounds rather than exactly. hearing music? Is that exactly. What you mean? I was astonished that within just a year, I could have manipulated my brain in that, in, 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 in that way. I still didn't sing very well, but, but it, was a, it was a fascinating experiment.